Kenny Powell scored a 95th minute equaliser to steal a point at the death against Huddersfield Town this afternoon, who had taken the lead via a goal from Jack Rudoni just nine minutes before that. I was sat in the upper lot, so as usual, here are my thoughts on the result. With Huddersfield just three points and a place above QPR in the championship, the opportunity was there for QPR to take hold of their destiny and leapfrog their opponents to safety. Of course, on the flip side, Huddersfield themselves had the chance to extend the gap back to six points. Arriving to Loftus Road on this sunny Sunday afternoon, the club clearly understood the weight of this match too, making multiple attempts to get the crowd up for it. First by handing out free scarves to QPR fans on entry, and secondly by unveiling the first signing of the Marti Cifuentes era on the pitch before kickoff, with 29-year-old Swiss striker Michael Frey joining from Royal Antwerp on a permanent deal, and unveiling I admittedly miss while being in the blue and white bar. A pretty nice surprise given Christian Nauri had said we'd be inactive this month, and presumably a signing that has been achieved by offloading Andre Dezel to Birmingham on loan. Anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about Frey at the end. The point is that the club were clearly trying to get us up for this. Marty Suentes understandably named an unchanged 11 from the Millwall win, while Huddersfield arriving at Loftus Road with just one win in 10 and winless in four matches made just one change from last weekend, handing new striker Radulovic his first start for Huddersfield Town, meaning three out of four of their January signings were in the starting 11. Adding to the high stakes of this match were the suggestions that Darren Moore's future is on the line, with suggestions that anything less than three points would result in Huddersfield making a change to the manager's position. Now unfortunately, while QPR clearly did understand the gravitas of today's match, that message was not received by the players. Because despite picking up a draw, this was as gutless a performance as I've seen from Rangers all season. We barely left our own half for the first half an hour. Not only because Huddersfield attacked us, with Reese Healy having an early header saved by Begovic, but because just like Watford and the first half against Millwall, we were absolutely insistent in playing out from the back. We invited pressure on ourselves and we were punished for it with everything but a goal from Huddersfield, who boxed us in and stopped us from playing up the pitch. I know Sifuentes wants us to play football, but this has got to stop because it prevented us from doing absolutely any harm to Huddersfield. It doesn't have to stop completely, but we do need to know when to mix it up. It was a long ball to Dykes in the middle last week that resulted in our first goal and regular balls into the channels and over the top to Armstrong made him a real threat last week. And without that kind of service, the pair of them might as well not have played today. And with our midfield also completely non-existent, we had no way of progressing the ball. I mean, it was very clear what kind of day it was going to be when Reggie Cannon went down injured just 13 minutes into the match and was replaced by Aaron Drew, who was immediately targeted on the following free kick. And our rather bizarre habit of being an incredibly left-sided team was completely prevented by consistent overloads from Huddersfield, with chair and power often doubled, sometimes tripled up on, so much so that Michael Hellick would see the first of the match's seven yellow cards for a dirty challenge on a large chair, something that absolutely incompetent referee Steve Martin, the worst First I've seen at Loftus Road this season, felt immediately compelled to balance the books by yellow carding Aaron Drew just one minute later for a completely nothing challenge. Martin, clearly relishing the sky cameras, was the other key factor stopping us from progressing up the pitch, because for the entire game he blew the whistle left, right and centre for absolutely anything and everything against QPR. The bias was absolutely shocking. I'm not going to go as far as to pin today's result directly on him, because we absolutely did not show up for it. But how are you supposed to pick up a precious three points when you have that standard of officiating? But as I say, we were our worst enemy. We clearly just did not show up for this. And save for Chris Willett's cross into a large chair on 29 minutes, with which all he could muster was a P-roller shot to the keeper, we did absolutely nothing in the first half. And I'm not really all too surprised because in some senses, we were very similar in that first half an hour until the first goal against Millwall. This wasn't a case of being toothless like we were against Watford. This was a case of being devoid of absolutely any initiative, creativity, passion or guts. This was a very poor first half from both sides. And you can see why Huddersfield are in the position that they're in. But they were a much better team than QPR. And they were actually trying to play the ball forward and attack Rangers. Jack Rudoni looked a constant threat for them in that first half and was trying to instigate moves for Huddersfield that I really wanted to see Chair doing the same. But ultimately, neither side could have felt disheartened about going into half-time nil-nil. Now, realistically, Sifuentes could have changed any of those players at half-time and none of them could have felt hard done by. I personally was hoping that Smith would come on for Willick and inject some much-needed energy into the game. But frustratingly, no changes were made 
and unsurprisingly, nothing changed in the match when play resumed. Once again, Huddersfield dominated play in the opening spells, with chances from Matos, Rudoni and Helic all in the first 10 minutes. Their constant barrage of corners was making me grip my teeth, because while we were defending pretty well, Jake Clark's were in particular the standout for me alongside a resilient Steve Cook. Begovic completely scares the shit out of me every time that ball comes into the box because I just don't know what he's going to do. And we didn't offer anything at all in response until the 60th minute, with a greedy Chris Willock invisible up to this point in the second period, having a shot outside of the box tipped over by the keeper when he really ought to have crossed it. Marty finally made some changes one minute later, with Willett coming off for Elijah Dixon Bonner and Lyndon Dykes for Paul Smith. Now you'll notice that I've only mentioned Dykes once up until this point, and that's because he did absolutely nothing today. I seriously don't actually remember him touching the ball. And as for Willock, I think he should be on the bench going forwards. He hasn't signed a new contract, and with his current one expiring in the summer, he's basically no longer our player, and he certainly played like that today. The ref showed some consistency by continuing to be an absolute pillock in the second half, pulling out all manners of ridiculous decisions, blowing the whistle 10 seconds after a Huddersfield player has gone down, despite QPR being on the break, and booking Sam Field for an absolutely blatant Huddersfield dive, resulting in him getting a two-game ban for his 10th yellow card of the season. Again, not too much of a loss because I really did not see Sam Field on that pitch today. Still, I haven't seen such one-sided refereeing in a long time, and that certainly did not help us. Like against Watford though, Smith's introduction did inject energy into the game, and that's why for me he needs to be starting games for us. On the 74th minute, we actually started to press Huddersfield, something we'd done very little of until that point, and we were rewarded with a mishit Huddersfield pass at the back falling to Elijah Dixon Bonner on the edge of the box, who with five QPR players in support opted to shoot to the bottom right, an effort that looked to have beaten the keeper but just bend it around that right post. I can't fault him for trying, but with all the QPR players he had around him, passing the ball looked to be the better option. And that was a theme for Rangers today as well, making the wrong decisions. After last week's win, we just returned to being this team that looked like they'd never played with each other again. With Chair and Powell being particular culprits for this, constantly misreading each other, resulting in the ball often going out of play when they tried to link up. I've got to say that Armstrong was pretty poor today as well, though admittedly he didn't get anywhere near the quality of balls he was being fed last week, but it did make me incredibly grateful that we have signed another striker today. And if we hadn't made life hard enough for ourselves throughout this match, Huddersfield had a fair go at it too throughout, with the goalkeeper time wasting from every goal kick to Steve Martin's delight, and players regularly going down to feign injury at every opportunity. But that is what you do in a game as big as this, you make life hard for the other team. So despite a small spate of QPR attempts, it was no surprise that it was Huddersfield that took the lead and looked to have killed the game on the 86th minute. And even less of a surprise was that it came from a set piece, with Huddersfield pumping the ball to offside leads at the back post, who nodded the ball to the centre of the box for Rodoni to flick on to Volker who attempted to volley the ball for a sea of players and rather fortunately saw the ball settle at the feet of Rudoni, perfectly positioned to coolly slot the ball into the bottom left corner. He was by far their best player today for me so I was not surprised at all to see him get the goal. And just like that it looked like the game was over. Now I did note that Lees was offside in this move but just like Steve Martin's dreadful officiating, I just can't pin the blame on this really. We were very poor today and Huddersfield for me did more to deserve to leave with the three points. And the reality is the only time that we started to look like we might be able to score a goal was after they scored, meaning that if they didn't, we probably wouldn't have either. And this was the most frustrating part because once Huddersfield got that goal, QPR actually started to attack properly. First, just two minutes after Rodoni's goal, the ball was released to chair into space down that left-hand side, and he cut inside and drove a low ball across the box to a cluster of Armstrong and Dixon Bonner neither of which could turn the ball into the net. Marty's final gambit was to introduce Adoma and Fox for Field and Jake Clark Salter. And with Steve Cook thrown up into the opposition's half, Huddersfield actually started to panic a bit. And on 95 minutes, when I really thought our doom had been sealed, Elias Chair played an absolute peach of a ball to the back post, which was kneed into the back of the net by our second top goal scorer, Kenneth Powell, claiming a completely undeserved point at the death. With Huddersfield's time wasting, there should have been more time to try and claim a winner at the end, but Steve Martin's final parting middle finger to QPR was to blow the whistle just one minute later. Well, we absolutely got away with one today because that was a poor, poor performance from all involved. Somehow we've managed to maintain a gap of just three points between us and Huddersfield. Not the complete end of the world given that it could have been six points, 
But if we can't get up for this game, I really struggle to see which ones we're going to get up for in the remaining 17. And thank God we signed a striker because once again, neither of ours looked like scoring today. So rather than spending too much more time talking about today's shit show, let's focus on Michael Frey a little bit for the final segment of the video. 29 year old Frey joins on a permanent deal from Royal Antwerp, a club he scored 22 goals for in 33 appearances. He spent the second half of last season on loan at Schalk, where he didn't score in any of his 15 appearances for the since relegated side. In fact, despite his age, he's actually had a lot of footballing experience in a lot of places, having played for nine different football clubs in five different countries before his move to QPR. Like any good sports journalist, I've spent some time watching some YouTube compilations of him. And while his goals aren't always pretty, his positioning sense does seem really good in the box. And the goals he does score seem to come from all kinds of angles. At six foot three, he seems to throw himself about in a way that Lyndon Dykes just doesn't. And he looks like he could be a real handful. Now, naturally, there are going to be some concerns, given that he didn't score any goals at Schalke, though that was in Germany's top flight. And the bigger worry for me is he actually hasn't played any football since the conclusion of last season. So when he's going to be match fit and able to contribute is yet to be known. Some have commented on the fact that his goal scoring record at the various clubs he's played for has been pretty patchy, but that's the reality, right? He wouldn't be signing for QPR if he was a 20, 30 goal a season striker. So here we have to trust Marty's judgment on this. It's no surprise given Sefuentes' European experience himself that his first signing would be one from Europe. And after us so desperately asking for another striker, we've got one through the doors, so let's see what he can do. Here's hoping that the Swiss striker can inject some fresh energy and ideas into this QPR side, because it is strongly needed ahead of a trip to Blackburn Rovers next weekend. If you want to know a bit more about Frey's background, I'm going to be doing a video focusing on him tomorrow, so make sure to keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much for watching, do let me know your own thoughts in the comments below, and if you've enjoyed this video and you haven't subscribed already, please do consider giving me a like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Cheers!